<laughs> uh, okay. Yeah, it, it, it's bad to do these recordings and have a bad hair day. So everybody can hear me okay, I suppose, right? Thumbs up. Okay, good. Um, you know, we've been talking about um, we've been talking about search, and I wanted to continue with the search. And what you're going to hear is here here is a little bit different, I think, than you would hear in other classes, and that is the the need for domain expertise in setting up a search. I used to have a friend at Boeing. His name was Mike Healy. And Mike was just a wonderful guy. And he did lots of searches and optimizations back in the days when computers weren't as fast as they are now. And um, he would spend hours coming up with just the right domain expertise, just the right penalty function in order to solve the problem he had at hand. And he dubbed himself along with a, with a colleague of, of his at Boeing that I also work with, Tom Cadell, as a penalty function artist. In other words, he would, he would spend lots of times creating penalty functions, creating the background and the infrastructure for the searches and the optimization that he was performing. And I always thought that was a great, a great illustration of the need for something like uh, active information and the sort of thing that we're going to talk about today. And again, the need for domain expertise. We're going to do two things today. Number one, we're going to uh, talk about the founding of the idea of the so-called no free lunch theorem that says, unless you have domain expertise, unless you bring domain expertise to a search, then one search on average is going to be about as good as another search if you don't know what, what's going on. Then we'll talk about the way that we can actually measure the amount of information that comes up. And so uh, that's, that's the second thing we'll do. You can't always measure it, but there's lots of things that allow us to, allow us to um, get an idea behind things. Uh, you know, I think in, for example, quantum mechanics there for Schrodinger's equations, there's just a handful of known closed form solutions, but there's numbers of approximations and um, there's numbers of different ways to, to get around approximating Schrodinger's equation. And the fact that we only have a few closed form solutions doesn't keep us from analyzing and doing the mathematics behind the quantum mechanics. Uh, so with that, let me go ahead and share my screen and get into the idea of um, active information, the necessity of active information. We want to talk about the necessity of active information. When I say active information, I mean the, the necessity for domain expertise in doing these different operations. So with that, let me go ahead and share my screen. And I think my, I'm not queued up correctly. Let me queue up my PowerPoint correct. Where'd my PowerPoint go? Don't go away. Okay, there we go. Okay, I'm gonna go back and we'll, we'll start by playing a clip. This is gonna be a fun clip. And we're going to do something which is define impossible. So share screen, um, share the sound, and I guess optimize for the video clip, I guess. <clears throat> okay, here's the idea. There's something called Burrell's Law. And hopefully everybody can see my PowerPoint presentation. If not, I can't see you. so you're gonna to have to say something. So if you're not saying it, please let me know audibly. So how do we define impossible? One of the, one of the ways to define impossible is through the mathematician Emil Burrell. Burrell came along and said, you know, if the probability is too small, if the probability is too small, we can say that something is impossible. And so I think I came up with the example that, that you're sitting there Right now, you have a finite probability of tunneling through your chair, doing a quantum tunneling through your chair. Chair. You also have a probability that you'll get hit during this lecture by space debris coming out of space. Those, but those are so small probabilities that ah, maybe we can discount them. Uh, you can say, and this is done in some of the courtroom dramas I've, I've 
I've heard. Is it possible? Well, yeah, you know, anything is possible. But when the probability becomes too small, improbable becomes the impossible. Uh, let me illustrate. This is <laughs> this is from the movie Dumb and Dumber, and this is an example of Burrell's law. Let's listen. I want to ask you a question, straight out, flat out. I want you to give me the honest answer. What do you think the chances are of a guy like you and a girl like me ending up together? Well, Lloyd, that's difficult to say. I and mean, We really don't... Hit me with it. Just give it to me straight. I came a long way just to see you, Mary. Just least you can do is level with me. What are my chances? Not good. You mean not good like one out of a hundred? I'd say more like one out of a million. So you're telling me there's a chance. Okay, so you can see from that interesting clip, which I think you've probably seen before from the movie Dumber and Dumber, Dumb and Dumber, that um, Lloyd Christmas believes that one in a million is a chance. Uh, so yeah, there is, there is a chance, one in a million. So you're telling me there's a chance. We can talk about probabilities and chances even more obscure than that and say, well, eh, you know, it doesn't make it. Um, Mary... I think he thought her last name was Samsonite. Mary Samsonite was saying, was trying to tell him that it was impossible for them to have a relationship, but she chose instead to posture it in terms of chances. And her chances were one out of a million. And hopefully she was communicating to him the idea that it was indeed impossible. So let me share my screen again and we will... Um, and we'll continue that continue with with this idea. So that is kind of defining impossible. Let's look at some things which I think uh, probably border uh, border in some way on a, on impossible. Uh oh, yeah, that's that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to do this one. Um, one of the things is what is the computational capacity of the universe in terms of bits. There is something called the Neumann, the von Neumann Landauer limit. Von Neumann, of course, is one of the greatest mathematician physicists of the uh, of the 20th century. Landauer, Landauer was also an incredible, an incredible physics. And they figured out this was the amount of data or amount of energy which was required in order to execute one irreversible bit. We won't get into the details of reversible but an irreversible, but this is an irreversible bit from the von, von Neumann Landauer or limit. So it's 1.5 times 10 to the minus 23rd joules. Now that's not a lot of information. But suppose that we took the mass of the universe, which turns out to be about 10 to the 53rd kilograms, and we convert it all to we convert all of the mass in the universe to energy using maybe the famous most famous equation that ever existed, E is equal to mc squared. And if we did that, we could generate 7.83 times 10 to the 92 bits. So this again is taking all the mass of the universe and converting it into bits. So let's ask our question, how long a phrase can we have if we had 7.83 times 10 to the 92 bits? How long of a phrase could we generate? Specifically, we want to look for a phrase of from an alphabet of n is equal to 27. Um, let's see, and that would be the English alphabet plus the space. And then L is the length, the length of the message. And we're going to do it like the blind man trying to guess the Rubik cube. We're going to guess a number of letters and we're going to say, is this it? No. Is this it? No. And what we're asking in each case is we're going to choose some letters and we are going to, um, we're going to choose the letters and we're going to ask if those letters constitute the target phrase. Okay. So let's take a look at that. First thing we do is define our target. So let's say in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Okay, Genesis 
Genesis 1.1. That's the phrase that we would like to generate. So the first thing we do is we guess a bunch of letters and we generate the following phrases. And in each case, we look at the phrases and we said, is this it? No. Is this it? No. Is this it? No. Eventually, there is a finite probability. It is possible that in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth would eventually pop up. Uh, you might expect that this is going to be a very long search as, as we look for all of these. So let's look at some different things. First of all, we're going to have L. L is going to be the number of characters in the, um, in the length here. And uh, what we're trying to do is show something which is possibly impossible. And the expected number of um, the expected number of uh, queries is going to be, oh, I'm sorry, the, the, the expenditure of the bits for each phrase is n raised to the lth power. So if we drew, we're just trying to guess one single character, one single character would just be n, one out of 27, or let's say a chance of 27 to one. If we had two letters, it would be n times n or n squared. So we would be choosing from n squared different uh, combinations. So in general, n, which is 27, and l is the length, is the number of bits that it cost us in order to uh, generate this, this um, each one of these phrases. So n to the l is the expenditure in bits. Now we might ask ourselves also, how many times do we have to do this? Well, let me let me give you a um, let me give you a little tutorial here, and I'm going to use my white screen here, and that is the concept of using uh, probability and expressing prob probability in bits. If you look at Shannon's original, great great paper. Uh, hopefully you can all see my whiteboard. If, if you can't, you're going to have to audibly let me know otherwise. Um, Shannon noticed that there was a better way to measure probability that, and that way of measuring probability is equal to I is equal to minus the log base two of a probability. Now, how, how is this related? This is the way that Shannon defined probability and the units for, or define information and i was in terms of bits well let's talk about this let's suppose that we flipped a coin and we had heads tails tails heads heads tails now we have five possibilities and we could literally interpret this if you will as a sequence of ones and zeros one one zero one one zero what is the probability that you flip a, flip a coin six times and you get this? Well, the probability of getting a heads is equal to one half. The probability of getting a tails is one half. The probability of getting each one of these is one half. The compound probability of getting all of these exactly in order is one half raised to the sixth power, right? I'm not sure what that is, but that's the probability of getting this specific sequence. So we can talk about a probability equal to one half to the sixth power. Now, suppose that we took this and we put it in the formula, log base two of one half to the sixth power. That's equal to the information. And I think you can see, well, first of all, there's a minus sign here. That's the same thing as the log of two to the sixth, the log base two of two to the six, which is equal to six. And we said that this result is going to be in bits. So therefore we have P is equal to one half to the sixth power. That's the probability. And that is equivalent according to Shannon's information measure of six bits. By the way, he defined this in 1948. And remarkably, it was the first paper ever that used the word bits in his in his great paper that founded information theory. So therefore, here's, here, here's the takeaway. If you have a probability, if you have a probability, uh, you can express the probability in terms of bits, in terms of information. Uh, 
And I like this because if you have something with a probability of two to the minus thousandth, I don't know what that means, or two to the, I don't know, minus 10,000. I don't know what that means. That's a number which is so small, I have no intuitive comprehension of what that means. But if you put that into bits, that turns out to be 10,000 bits. And yeah, I kind of understand what 10,000 bits says. So again, information measured in bits is just another way of measuring probability. And we can get the information here by taking the log base two, and we can do the inverse here by doing the probability is equal to two to the minus information. So that's just inverting, inverting this formula. So the probability is equal to two raised to the minus information. So if we had six bits, that would correspond to a probability of one half to the sixth power. So the entire point that I want to make on the screen is that we can measure, we can measure um, probabilities in terms of bits. And that's kind of cool. Uh, I, I, I suspect that you've never seen bits expressed this way. Maybe you have, but this is the way that Claude Shannon did when he founded information theory. He expressed it this way. Now let's, uh, let's take something else here. Here's something else that I want to do. Let's see, how do I clear this? I go up here, clear all drawings. Suppose you have something called a Bernoulli trial. You all remember, I think, the Bernoulli trial. It is a trial that you either have a success or you have a failure. And we do a so-called repeated, um, a repeated uh, experiment until we get a success. And so we do a first experiment. <clears throat> oh, by the way, the Bernoulli trial is dictated by a single probability, which is P, which is the probability of success. So let's look at generating a sequence of Bernoulli trials and looking what would happen. So we try, we try the first one, we get a failure. Then we try the second one, we get a failure. Then we keep on trying this. We keep on getting failures. And eventually we get a success. And so if we talk about the random variable as the number of iterations that we have, this would be trial number one, two, and uh, up to say, up to say, um, Let's see, I need a number here, a variable. Uh, let's just say X, for example. So what is the expected value of X? What is the expected value of the number of flips that you'll have before you get a success? I have heard it said that this is kind of the uh, Russian roulette sort of probability that you put a you you put a bullet in a gun in the chamber of a gun you spin it and then you shoot it and no that was a failure you spin it again and you shoot it and it doesn't work and you spin it again and you shoot it it doesn't work and you spin it again and then bang so that again is a number of trials before a so-called success. How many times are you gonna to have to perform this operation? Well, it turns out that the only parameter here is P. The only parameter is P. So it turns out the expected value of X is equal to one over P. If you take a probability class, uh, you find out that this is referred to as a geometric random variable. A geometric random variable X. That's the way I make my capital letters, by the way. I just put big, big uh, things at the top and the bottom. Uh, the, the, the geometric random variable X and the expected value of X as we had up here is one over P. Okay. So let's get back to this generation of random sequences. And so we have a number of letters. We want to get in the beginning, God created the heaven and earth. So uh, we have 
X uh, L uh, I uh, space uh, V N uh, whatever like that. Okay, and the the probability of success here is going to be let's see we said it's going to be n to the minus l that is the probability that is the probability of success here n to the minus l so that's the probability of success and then we're going to repeat this a number of times and each one of these has a probability of of being correct as n to the minus l so the question is, how many times are we going to have to flip this thing? How many times, not, not flip this thing, how many queries are we going to have in, before we get this final result? It's going to be one over P. So therefore, the number of queries that we're having, uh, this again is the expected value of X. The expected value of X is equal to one over P, which in this case is N, over, N to the Lth power. So again, in order to achieve a success, we're gonna to have to go through N to the L trials on average to finally get our success in this Russian roulette sort of probability, okay? Now, how many, how many bits is required uh, for us to perform this operation? I'm gonna go back to the screen right now. The number that we have is n to the L. That's the number of queries that we have to have. Now, the number of bits that is used in each query is n to the L. Or, I'm sorry, the log base two of n to the L. So again, this is the number of bits. This is the number of bits used in a single query. This is the, the, the so this is the bits per, bits per query, if you will. bits per query. This is equal to the number of queries. So this turns out to be a very interesting, interesting number because if we look at this and um, we, fix, we fix N, N is fixed, there is the question, how long of an element do we have so that the number is equal to this large number that we had. We want to have 7.8 times 10 to the 92th bits. So what, what is this? This is the number of bits that we have in the universe. This is the number of bits that we have in the universe. And that's equal to this, which is the bit cost in doing a search for uh, something with a length of L and a, uh, an alphabet of N. Now we have here a transcendental equation. We know what this is. We know how many bits we have available. We know what N is, but we're not sure what L is. And L you cannot solve for in closed form, but we can do a solution for it. And the question is, if we had all of these bits in the universe, how, how long L of a result could we look for? And it turns out, astonishingly, only 63 letters. So again, we know, we know what the bit capacity of the universe it is. We know what N is, that's, uh, that's 27, and we want to solve for L. If we solve for L, we would find out that it's about 63. Now that's astonishing. So for a specific target, of, of length uh, 63, I'm sorry, for a specific target of length 63, searching for it with no domain expertise of just saying, is this it? Yes. Is this it? No. Is this it? No. Is this it? No. Is this it? No. We, it, we would exhaust ourselves with, we would exhaust the computational power of the universe in a, a, a statement of 63 letters. Now, that is getting to the point of impossible. Then according to Burrell's law, it would be impossible. And one might say, okay, well, here is some different things. Suppose that we, uh, 
suppose that, where'd my marker go? Okay, there it is, okay. Right down here is the mass of the universe. So this number is 63, I think we said. Now there are hypotheses of, uh, there, there are many models of the multiverse. And I'm just gonna look at one of them, which is very popularly used, which says that there's 10 to the 500th and up to the 10 to the thousandth multiverses. And even if we use 10 to the 1000 multiverses or universes in a multiverse and make this assumption, again, we're not doing anything uh, really scientific. We're just trying to generate big numbers that we can relate to. So 10 to 1,000th universes, we would have the capacity of generating a length, uh, a bit length of, I don't know, what does that look like? Uh, five, six, I don't know, less than 750 characters. A blind search without any information. So here's the point. If we have, if we have this incredible information resource, that needs to be executed for knowing no information about what we're looking at. Is this it? No. Is this it? No. Is this it? No. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. And we need, we need to find something else. So search algorithms become very, very quickly exhausted giving the computational resources of the universe. We could even come up with, um, with measures which are more um, draconian than the, the von Neumann Landauer limit. Uh, we can come up with um, all sorts of different big numbers associated with the universe that are exhausted. One of the things which uh, always kind of bugged me after a while, which bugged me, whoops, stop share. One of the things that bugged me for a while was the specificity of the target. Uh, I just wrote a paper, which is gonna be a book chapter and that book chapter is going to look at the probability of generating <clears throat> any phrase of meaning and any meaningful phrase. And by meaningful, we're talking about it generates a sequence of words and any of these words, um, they, in order to pass a test, they just have to be in the dictionary. Even there, the number of the, the number that is required and the information resources is just astronomical. You would think that if we were just, if we relaxed our target search for anything meaningful, that we would do a lot better. No, it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Okay. Hopefully you're looking at this and you're going, my goodness, those are almost unbelievable. And yes, they are almost unbelievable. I don't want to, I don't want to close it. Okay, let's see what happens. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I got, I got stuck. I got stuck and they, uh, they made me close it. So I have to open this thing up again. I don't know how to work around this. All these things are just, uh, are just a mystery to me. So let me try to share my screen again. And we'll go ahead and work onwards of this. So this kind of suggests that we need a domain expertise. Now there are things which um, which come up, uh, which are common. Common. Um, oh, what's the word I want? They're, 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 they're common arguments which are made. Um, one of them is well, what about when we get uh, quantum computing? Uh, does quantum computing help? I think as we talked last time, the quantum computing reduces computing time by a square root. So if you have billions and trillions, you get the square root of a uh, square root of a billion. What's the square root of a billion? 10 to the sixth would be, no, 10 to the ninth. Let's take a trillion, 10 to the 12th. Uh, the square root of a trillion is 10 to the sixth, which is a million times a million. So it's still it's still pretty big. This is something known as Grover's algorithm. You can see the, you can see the reference here at, at the bottom of the page. So yeah, quantum computing is going to help. What about more and more complex computers? And uh, OK, 
okay, where's my, where's my, uh, okay, more and more complex computers. We talked about this last time, that if we have something and we could do, say, a million bits in a year, and we applied kind of Moore's law, interpreting Moore's law as a doubling, as a doubling of the computational speed. If we could do million bits in a year, then we doubled the, the um, computation of a computer. Then we could look at a million and one bits. We could search for a million and one bits because we've just doubled it. So let's talk then about information and search. We've kind of gone through an example where it shows that we need domain expertise, that the computational resources do not work even for moderately complex sort of search algorithms. So here's the general idea behind a search. You have a probability search space and this search space is denoted by uh, the probability of omega and that's the probability of the universal set that has to be equal to one. You have in engineering design, you have a target in here and this target is going to consist of all of the solutions that you consider acceptable. And again, we typically don't look maybe for the optimum, but we look at a performance which exists above some sort of threshold. And so here's the idea. You do a, uh, you do a test and you say, is this it? No, it doesn't lie within the target. Is this it? No. Is this it? No. So you're choosing a random point in the search space, and eventually you're going to get to the point where you go, is this it? Yes, yes, that works, that works. So this is the, uh, th this is the idea of just laying out a search space. Now, here is the probability. The probability of success is, if you will, the number of elements in this target that's what this magnitude means. That means the cardinality or the number of numbers in the target divided by the total number of uh, elements in the search space. This is something which is incredibly obvious. And each point in the parameter space has a fitness. We looked at this with the pancakes, right? And the problem of the search is to find a good enough fitness uh, to allow for the search to be declared complete. And so we have this subset of acceptable solutions. And typically, if we're doing maximization, they are going to lie on top of the fitness curve. So this fitness curve corresponds to this little target down here. Now, search algorithms. Let's talk about search algorithms. What we could do is apply a number of different search algorithms. And I've listed a few here. You won't know what they mean, but I'll explain one or two uh, to you here. There's steepest ascent. Steepest ascent has an assumption, and you notice that in all of these, there has to be a domain, a domain assumption. Steepest ascent assumes that the search space is smooth in some sense. Uh, steepest ascent says you choose a point on the search space, stay here. And don't forget, you don't know the search space. You're looking at your feet. The only thing you know is the result that you have now at your current location, plus the values of, plus the values that you had in um, previous searches. So you might, you might have, you might have searched here and you might have searched here. And so this is your third search. And now what you want to do is you want to do better. So you can think of this as being on a hillside and looking at your toes. And you know where you were before, and you know, looking at your toes, you're doing pretty good. So you stick out your toe at random, and you see what happens. So we're gonna, we're gonna switch, our toe, switch our toe at random. Uh, where's my color? So we're going to switch our toe at random and go down to this point. Well, that wasn't a very good choice, was it? We're going, going to go down to this point. Okay, well, shoot, if that, that's worse than where you were before, right? Because it's at a lower point. So what you do is you go back and you go back to here and you stick out your toe in another direction 
and uh, you might get this point. Well, this point, this point has a higher value. So you forget this point, you chalk it up to a previous result, and you keep on sticking your toe out. And as long as you go uphill, hopefully, if your assumption about the search space being smooth is correct, you're going to be approaching eventually some high level. The problem of this, of course, is there such thing as local minima. And one of the problems with local minima is that, uh, or local maxima in this case, it should be. Uh, it could be that you're climbing the hill. This is a one dimensional example. And you, so you climb it and climb it and climb it. And you say, oh, you know, I'm here. And no matter which way I go, I go downhill. This must be the result. So you're, you're trapped in a so-called local maximum. And there are ways to kick out of that. And one of them is simulated annealing. Uh, we have a student, uh, Adam Goad, who is using simulated annealing for optimization of circuits using this search algorithm. I'm going to have him come on and just give you a five-minute example of simulated annealing. And he'll describe it at that time. But simulated annealing is a way where you can have smooth surfaces, you can have local maxima, but you can still shake, your out, shake yourself out of those local maxima. So the, um, and we've also talked, if you, if you will, about exhaustive search, right? Exhaustive search means you just search every single point ad nauseum. But we've seen, for example, in the search for a specific phrase that that doesn't even work. Okay. For some reason, I'm not being able to update this. Okay, problem. In order to work better than average, each algorithm implicitly assumes something about the search space and or location of the target. Remember, we talked about the idea of knowing nothing. When you do a search, when you do an optimization, you better know something. You better have some domain expertise that you bring to bear on your solution. When you design a circuit, you're bringing domain expertise of Kirchhoff's laws, your knowledge of the way that these different devices work, and you're bringing all of that into the solution of the design of your circuit. And if you didn't have that, you'd be up a crick. Now, just to show you the different uh, results that you can, the different searches that you can have is I compiled a list. I compiled a list of search techniques. Look at this. Adaptive coordinate descent, alpha beta pruning, ant colony optimization, artificial immune system optimization. These are different searches, search algorithms that you can find in the literature. And they're numerous. And it used to be that we would think that there are some searches which are better than others. And I got to admit that I was one that was guilty early in the area, early in the, um, early in the game before the no free lunch theorem was put out. We published a paper which compared CART classification regression trees to neural networks in terms of classification. And we looked at uh, four or five different problems and concluded that neural networks were better than CART. Well, this, in light of the no free lunch theorem, which I'm going to share with you, is totally bogus. It turned out that the problems that we worked, that we chose, were better solved by neural networks than by CART. But there were other problems, according to the no free lunch theorem, where the CART would, would solve the problems better than neural networks. There is no one search algorithm globally better than any other search algorithm. Now, in the search algorithms, they're, they're, with, with the advance of computers and um, and um, parallel computing, there are different methodologies of search. The old searches, when computers were a little bit slow, just had a single person on the hillside looking down at their toes. They knew where they were at, they knew where they had been, and they're trying to figure out where to go in order to optimize. Just one guy 
climbing this hill and hopefully hopefully finding the peak here. I hope you can see my cursor. Well, I guess I can I guess I can put it here. Hopefully finding the optimization, which was the peak right here. Right. Now with um, so-called um, multi-agent search, you can have a bunch of guys which are climbing around the climbing around the landscape. And not only that, they're looking at their feet and they know where they're at. They know the fitness of where they're at. But not only that, they can communicate with everybody else. So everybody knows what everybody is doing. Uh, one of the most successful of these is so-called particle swarm search. But even this, even particle swarm search has problems associated with it. One of the most popular ones was um, evolutionary computing. Evolutionary computing was born in the 60s and 70s. It turned out there were lots of theories of evolution as, opposed, as related to biology. And uh, everybody knew that you couldn't go into a lab and recreate the process of evolution. It would just take too long. So everybody was really excited when the computer came along, the biologists were, that said that we could look at this Darwinian evolution, we could simulate it on a computer and show that it indeed worked. And they come up with the idea of evolutionary computing. It is a viable area in, in uh, electrical engineering. There is a journal called the IEEE Transactions on Evolutionary Computing. There is a yearly conference on uh, IEEE for evolutionary computing. So, it, so it's still going on and it does have its niche and it does have a place where it can be used. But here's the basic idea. The basic idea is that the evolutionary search from, a dark, from the biological perspective had the following, the following steps. You had, first of all, you, you, first of all, you had mutation. After mutation, you ranked the people, ranked your population in accordance to fitness and killed off the weakest, only survival of the fittest, if you will, survival of the fittest. So you killed off the weakest, you only had survival of the fittest. Then once you had survival of the fittest, your population was reduced. So you replicated what was left in order to fill up all of the, all of the agents that had died. And so now you have a new population. And now you repeat the process. You do the mutation. You do the survival of the fittest. Repopulation. Mutation. Survival of the fittest. Repopulation. And again, and again, and again, and uh, is what you do in the process of evolutionary computing. Now there's lots of variations on this. But, um, but that's the basic, that's the basic steps. Okay. Uh, here, here's an example of the cooking of the pancake. Okay. We're cooking this pancake and uh, probably, let's see, down here is better. So you have a mutation. Now, what does a mutation mean in, 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 in cooking pancakes? Well, you might take the recipe and take one of the elements and change it a little bit. So instead of six pinches of salt, you use five pinches of salt, for example. Instead of uh, two cups of pancake mix, you use, you use one cup. Uh, so that's a mutation. And this can be done randomly. So you have these N different competing recipes. These recipes are fed to an oracle. Now, what the oracle is, is it ranks each one of the recipes. So what it is doing is ascertaining the survival of the fittest. So Bob the taster might come along and says, well, this recipe has a seven, this one has a two, this one has a 18 or a, a 10. So what do you do then? You do survival of the fittest. So you kill off the, you kill off the weak. So this is two, that isn't big enough. And I don't want to 10, say that the fitness goes up to 20, because right? If, if it only went up to 10, I'd quit here, okay? So the fitness goes up to 20. So you kill off the weak. And then what you do is you repopulate. Everything that is killed, you replace by an existing recipe. So you take this recipe and this one was killed. You replace it by, say, recipe number seven. And this is done, this is done um, in each step. Then you have, uh, then you have the... Uh, 
the, the repopulation. You do the, well, survival of the fittest and then the repopulation. And then you come around and you do the loop again. You do the mutation, you change some of the elements of the recipe, you come around and you present the new batch of recipes to the Oracle. And we're assuming here that everything can be done on a computer. You know, we, we talked about Bob the Taster, I think it was, but we're assuming that we can do this all on a computer. We generate the fitness, we do survival of the fittest and repopulation, we mutate and we go around and around and around and around. And hopefully this iteration will converge onto a really good solution. So that is evolutionary computation. And notice what we're doing is we're searching for the best pancake. We are doing a design, if you will, by searching for the best pancake. And it works. Here, here is a very interesting result, which made a, made, um, a lot of news. Uh, many of you have seen this Yagi Uda antenna on top of houses, for example, in third world countries. And, uh, you know, when I was a boy, we used stuff like the Yagi Uda antenna in order to pick up television stations. This was designed to pick up things from, from uh, waves, radio waves, and convert them into the, uh, and, and feed them into a TV set where they were converted into audio and video. And so this was used for many years. And can we do better? Well, engineers at NASA created a parameterized model. They established a degree of the design's fitness. And how do they do this? In other words, how do you design fitness? Well, it turns out that Maxwell's, under, uh, Maxwell's equations and antenna design is pretty well established and known mathematically. So you do, look at this model and you feed it into the software program. You feed it into the software program and the software program tells you how well your design does as an antenna. And it can rank it, if you will, on a scale of one to 10 or whatever scale that you're using. And um, then what you do is that you do what? The mutation and the repopulation. So you create a parameterized model, you establish the design's fitness, you perform a survival of the fittest, then you do a mutation, and this goes around and around and around and around and around. And here's what they came up with. This, this you'll find very fascinating. Um, they came up with an antenna that in my mind looks like a cork, a, a cork with a bunch of paper clips stuffed inside. And this antenna turned out to work pretty well. In fact, it worked out well enough that it was deployed into space. And this was designed by the process of evolutionary computing. Now, the question, if you were assigned to do this and you, and you were um, applying evolutionary computation, how would you do it? How would you, how would you create the parameterized model? Well, first of all, you would have to, let, let's assume that there's four paper clips, if you will, in here. One of the things you could do is you could parameterize the length of each one of the bends. You could provide the angle of the bend, the length of the second part of the bend, the second angle, the length of this third bend, this angle, and the length of this angle. Now, all of those parameters would dictate how this one paperclip was bent, right? And you're not sure where to bend it and how much to bend it. So we're just going to choose this at random, and we're going to generate the paperclip in accordance to these lengths and these bending angles. And then we're going to do that for all four of the different, uh, all four of the different results. And for each one of these lengths in bending, we can submit it to this software up here, and it gives us a ranking of how well that antenna does. So we have the fitness. And by the way, it's often that this fitness computation is the most computationally expensive part of the evolutionary search, of finding out what the fitness is. That's usually the most computational computationally difficult of the search. And it applies the idea of, of uh, evolution. It does the, 
it, it establishes the measures design fitness. It does the mutation, well, the fitness, then um, survival of the fittest. It kills off all, all of the designs that aren't working well. It repopulates the ones that are killed off with ones that are working and then does a global mutation of the entire population. And again, it goes around and around and around and around. And the people at NASA came up with this interesting design. Now, here's an interesting question. Ah, uh, man, I don't want to do that. Okay. Um, here, here's an interesting question. Who should own the patent for this antenna? Should the program own the patent? Or should the engineers own the patent? The engineers who initially built the parameterization and wrote the software to check. Um, because Wouldn't we know- Oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, Sam. Wouldn't it depend on the- uh... The terms of the research funding, probably. Like if <laughs> okay, if the engineers signed over the, their intellectual property, you know, then they wouldn't own it. Okay, let me let me rephrase the question. The, the let's rephrase the question is: Should the patent belong to the AI or not? It, even if it was assigned, who should be credited for it? The human or the software? Well, that depends on if computers can own property, according to law which i don't i'm not an expert but i would assume that they can't um so probably well, I, I would maintain i would maintain that the, this is the following scenario and if i were an expert witness in this case i would go i would go in and i would say look here is the problem that has been solved the engineers worked out a space of possible solutions billions even trillions of solutions and those trillions of solutions might be a function of how long the paper clip was, how much it was bent, et cetera. And so all of those permutations would be included in all of these possible solutions. Then the computer engineers wrote a program to wade through these trillions of possibilities and come up with the best result. So it was the engineers that, that, um, that put together this design process. And I would say that this is just an exploding example of, say, Formula 409, where there were probably thousands of different possibilities, and they had to experimentally wade through them all. Now, here we don't have to do experiments. We can just regulate everything, relegate everything to a computer. So we don't have to worry about that. And again, this gets back to my idea that I presented previously, is that computers themselves cannot be creative. The creativity comes from the programmer. The programmer set up all of the different solutions and then wrote a program to wade through these solutions in order to get a result. So that's my take. Anybody want to have another opinion? And that's, and I'm also not a lawyer, but uh, anybody have another opinion? Oh, that's good. Sounds like I convinced everybody. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure, sure. What do you got? Be off topic, but it's fine. Would you consider like biologically biological purely natural processes in the same boat as a computer in that sense? In in what sense? I I'm not. In, could you elaborate? That, that, that it follows a certain algorithm, and um, it doesn't create. Like oh, we think of creativity. Well, th this, this is very interesting. Like we went through swarm intelligence and swarm intelligence has fascinating emergent behaviors. Wouldn't you agree? Okay, is, um, you know, that's a good question. Where, well, first of all, where did that creativity come from in the swarms? And I think you get into theological questions. I think that God Almighty probably put them there. Or if you don't believe in that, may, if you're materialist, maybe you might think that evolution uh, put those properties there. But nevertheless, they are, they are there due to some sort of process. Now, if you, and this ha, the following has happened, you can look to nature. In fact, we looked at nature all the time. And Romans 1.20 says that we know that God exists since we can look at all of his creations and say, just like the 
uh, painting needed a painter, creation needs a creator. And that's basically what it says. And we can look at that creation and engineers do this all the time in borrowing from nature in order to make engineering applications. For example, here, here's a great example. Do you know where the idea of Velcro came from? An, an engineer was out walking in the forest and came back and he had all, all these burrs sticking to his socks. Did you ever do that when you walk through the woods? And he thought, wow, this is very interesting. So he ripped off a burr, he put it under the microscope and he saw these little hooks that these little things have. And he says, wow, we can make something like that and ended up making Velcro. So that's an example of something we borrow from nature. And Velcro was patentable. I don't think you're going to patented, uh, patented those burr seeds sticking to your socks, but you could patent uh, Velcro. In fact, um, I had a grandfather with a third grade education, and he said, he, he told me, Bob, he says, that man never did anything that God didn't do first. And he's, he's, he's pretty right. You know, everything that we have, we have done, we have invented, we have the outboard motor. If you look at the um, flagellum and the little whip that they have, the flagellum and the bacterial flagellum. And, you know, there's lots of stuff which nature created. And I think that that probably isn't patentable. But if we take something out, if, if, if we look to nature and we uh, come up with an invention based on an inspiration from nature, yeah, that's probably patentable. I don't know if that answered your question, Matthew. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> okay. Okay. Okay, there's, there's the antenna. Uh, all of this brings us to the no lunch, free, no free lunch theorem. This was published a number of years ago by Warburton and McCready, and it was published in the IEEE Transactions on Evolutionary Computing. In fact, it was published in the first issue that they had. And here is this knowing nothing with no knowledge of where the target is at and no knowledge about the fitness service. One search performs on average as good as any other search. Wow, that is quite a statement because uh, like I said, I used to believe the opposite. I believe that neural networks were better than CART. No, it was just on the problems that we tried it on. This is the no free lunch theorem. Um, let me give you an example which really illustrates this. Suppose we had this lock. It has 10 possibilities. And we want to figure out a way of opening this lock in five tries. So we try 0000, zero, zero, zero and we try 9876. And then we try 1234. And none of those work. Do any of those tell you anything about what your next result should be. Can you apply the stochastic hill climbing, the steepest ascent sort of thing, where, where you take a, a, a step and you're getting better, and you take another step, you get worse, I don't know, we ain't going to go that way. Take another step, you're getting better. Can you apply that? No. In fact, there's really no search algorithm that you can do this. If your chances of opening a lock in five tries is independent of the algorithm which is used. So you can go back and remember this list. Let's see if I, I can get it really quickly here. No, I guess I can't. Remember that big list of search, there it is. Uh, would any of these search algorithms work on that combination lock? Absolutely not. There's no way that you could figure out what to do next if you were searching for the correct, if you were searching for the correct combination. And what throws us off here? Well, well, here's an illustration. This is from a, um, a the idea is from a paper by, oh gosh. I, I, I'll tell you in a minute. It's from a paper, but this is a specific algorithm. And these are all of the, uh, these are all of the search algorithms I'm sorry, these, this is a set of all search algorithms which can be applied to a specific problem. And I like to think of this as one kind of a, like a flat waterbed. Now, if you know waterbeds, if you push in one point, it's going to pop out somewhere else. 
So if you have in this set of all algorithms, if you have this in this set of all algorithms, the uh, some places where you have some algorithms that work really, really good, it means that there will be some other algorithms that work badly on the same problem. So this is a space of algorithms now. So here's an example, this works, this works. You have an algorithm that does very, very well here, but it can must equally do not well here. So if you think of this as a bulge in the waterbed, that bulge in the waterbed is counteracted by a indentation in the waterbed here. You push down here, it pops up here. This one cannot be done. This cannot be done, you cannot come up with a, a, a problem where all of these algorithms are better than average. So this one doesn't work, this one doesn't work, this one doesn't work because there's a preponderance of bulges which do not take into account the indentation here. So there has to be a law of conservation of how these algorithms perform. Schaefer is a guy I want. Uh, let me give you some examples of some problems where this would apply. Uh, here is a fitness landscape that is not smooth. Uh, Doug Axe, in one of his papers from Biologic Institute, showed in biology some of the search spaces were kind of like this. And that if you applied steepest descent, you're going to get you're going to get stuck on the top of one of these cones. And that has nothing to do with the good design. And if you get stuck on the top of one of these little cones, uh, you know, you're out of luck. You're out of luck if you use steepest ascent. So the idea of a smooth surface does not always work. Another example is this space. Shoot. I got to quit doing that. I wanted to check the time. I was trying to be a good steward of our time, but that didn't work. Okay, here's another, here's another interesting one. This is, a, um, this is a jagged landscape formed by the number of ones needed to express an integer in binary form. You can read this at the bottom. For example, 67 is equal to 100011, and it has three ones. So if you go up here to 67, where's 67? 67 is right here, so it should have, it should have a fitness, say, of three since it has three ones in here. There's no way that you can search this using uh, steepest ascent. So what do you use? Are there algorithms which can perform optimization on a, on a surface like this? Yes, but you would have to know something about the surface in order to choose the correct algorithm. Uh, here, here, here is another example, very interesting example, is that many times you think the closer you're getting to the optimum, the better. This is not always the case. This is illustrated here by a car that wants to get to Chick-fil-A here, go through the drive through Well, the closest distance from the car, the closest distance from a car is a line that goes straight up, right? But there's a building in the way. So the optimal solution is to go this way, this way, and this way. And that's the optimal solution. And so just because you're close to a solution doesn't mean you're going to get there. One of the examples here is the solution of the Rubik's cube. If you solve the Rubik's cube and you get to the point where you're only two colors off in the Rubik's cube, uh, that doesn't mean you're close to the solution. If you talk to Rubik's cube experts, what you have to do is you have to back off in the Rubik's cube and you have to get to a point which will allow you to go forward bloop, 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 in order to get the results. So again, with the Rubik's cube, just because you're close to a solution, doesn't mean that you're almost, uh, that, that you're doing better. So closeness doesn't work. And then I think we'll probably end with this. Um, here is a point. This, this is kind of a fun problem. This is problematic fun. You are at a point here. You see this? And you want to get from, you want to get from point A to point B. Now, everybody knows that according to Pythagoras, that the distance between here is the square root of two, correct? Now, suppose if we go with the Manhattan distance, which is the distance where you can only go right and left. If you go right here half, you, you go here, and then you go here, and then you go here, how long is this path equal to? 
I think you can see that this path is equal to two. Do you agree with that? Because if we add up the horizontal values, if we add up the horizontal values, let's see the horizontal value should go all the way over here. This distance plus this distance is equal to one. In a similar fashion, how much do we go up? We go this distance plus this distance, which is one. So the total trip that we do is equal to two, correct? Now we're gonna come down here and we're gonna take a little bit different tessellation. We're gonna go to the right, up, to the right, up, to the right, up, to the right, up. Well, how much is there? Well, it turns out that if we do the horizontal pass, the horizontal paths again add up to one and the vertical paths add up to one. And then if we go over here and even make the steps smaller, here the value is two, here the value is still two. And we can make the steps smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And it doesn't go to the square root of two, it goes to two. Isn't that curious? So my question to you is, what's going on here? Does everybody understand the problem? The interesting, curious problem? Doesn't look like it works in the limit, does it? It doesn't look like it's a square root of two. It looks like it's a, uh, look like it's a one. Anybody have a solution? Matthew. Coordinate system. <laughs> no, it has nothing to do with the coordinate system. This is simple. Uh, this is simple uh, Euclidean geometry. By the way, is everybody? Am I in a small in a small cube on your screen, or a small square? I want you to know my notice my shirt. New topic. You see my shirt? Pretty cool. Okay. What's happening there? This is an engineering problem, totally different from what we were just talking about. I just noticed that. What's going on here? You learned this in 3335. Is that aliasing? That's aliasing. Yeah, that's aliasing. Because what happens is my shirt, if you look at if you look at a blown up picture of me, is has a frequency of of vertical lines that are very closely spaced. And in that little cubicle, it doesn't have enough resolution to differentiate those lines. So it literally has spatial aliasing. So looks like I have on a really cool shirt, right? It's a magical shirt that goes back and forth. Okay, so I think uh, what we'll do for next time is I'd like you to think about that, uh, uh, that little problem of the city block sort of way and taking that to the limit and why that isn't the square root of two and see what you can uh, what you can come up with okay and we'll continue with or, uh, down this path and hopefully this the, the entire point of this is to show you that good engineers need to be like mike healy you need to be a penalty function artist in order to in order to solve these optimization problems you need to come in with as much expertise as you possibly can in order to simplify your search okay that's that's kind of the bottom line any questions at all okay if not we'll we'll go ahead and end it thank you for your attention we will see you uh, thursday